G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the Round 11 stock market video. Hope you've had a crack of a week so far. It is a very, very big week in regards to our trades because we know that the buys are coming up very, very quickly. One more week until we get stuck into them. So these trades are particularly crucial because we really need to be taking into account what our buy structure is looking like. If you haven't done that yet, I highly suggest that you do that before you make your final trades this week. But we are blessed because we've got some really nice fallen premiums. You can see right there in the middle, Matty Rowell, I think he's going to be a really decent pickup this week. Blokes like Dan Houston down back. Could you still go the fish? We'll have a discussion about him. Some people got extremely unlucky last week. I'm looking at my brother, Janeth. Bought in Isaac Rankin. Was looking like a terrific trade up until about 15 seconds left in the game where... He pinged a hammy, now out for three weeks. think he's probably a trade-out at this stage. Aaron Cadman down the bottom. He's done the job for us, but the last couple of weeks just has not been good for Mr. Aaron, so he's got to go out. His break-even's at 100-plus. Then we've got a couple of rookies up the top. Probably the most popular one this week will be Joe Richards from Collingwood. We think he's got some decent job security with the injuries that they're facing down there at the Pies. So... Hopefully, you can find yourself a decent pick to bring into your side this week. We'll also obviously talk about all the blokes that you should be looking to trade out. So, I will keep the intro really short this week because it is very, very late. These Thursday night games are an absolute killer, but we'll certainly get this out uh, the Wednesday night. We're hoping to do it by, let's just say, 3.30 a.m. That's the goal anyway. So thanks again for all the support, guys. Thanks to the new members of the channel. Please remember to send me an email because I'll send you a PDF version of every, every slide that you see. And again, thank you very much to anyone that has visited the website, supercoachswordplay.com, and grab yourself a beanie. $5 does go to the RCH. And you can also pick yourself up a hoodie, a T-shirt, a notebook, plenty of cool stuff there as well. And uh, again, really appreciate all the support for that one. So that's it for the intro, guys. Hope that you all. Let's see who's at the top of the list of the 500k plus defenders. At the top list this week is Eddie Richards. He is transforming into a very fine midfielder, it seems. We have three weeks of data and signs are looking positive. A massive pod selection that could take your team to the next level if it works out. Since moving into the midfield, he's scored 82, 163 and a 118 last week, gone up over 60k. The main concern here is when Liver comes back into the side. He has been cleared to play football again, which is fantastic for Liver. I've really been feeling for that man. So great to hear that news, but the news may not be fantastic for Richards. In saying that, do you really want to mix things up when it's going so well at the moment? He's been a revelation in that midfield, offers something different. So even with Liver back, does this bloke still keep his spot in that midfield rotation? I'm not too sure if he does. I think it'll be a terrific selection. Keep in mind, your buy structures may or may not allow you to get another Doggies player in, so make sure that you check that. But look, he's a pod selection with a lot of upside in this particular role. If you trust that the role stays, then feel free to pick him up. But I've just got a few question marks on that, and I'm not overly confident. Uh, Wanganeen Miller, I really like this bloke as a pod. Such an elite user and decision maker. Has a friendly role, really nice Marvel run coming up. Saw him last week give about five dummies in the one play, and then delivers long ball inside 50. And I think that really showcased what he's actually made of. 30 touches on the weekend, 23 of those kicks which we like only four contested but we know that isn't his role and at the end of the day he was awarded with 112 points took almost 50 percent of the kick-ins played on from all eight of them bonus points in the bank there and i do remember Cameron telling me i was having a chat with him on insta and he was encouraging him to play on from the square because we both owned him last year and apparently naz wasn't aware of that that you get the extra stats so uh, well done Kama, for looking after us there mate a uh, a good man his Kama. uh but look at the end of the day, he's been super consistent. The last three weeks, he's been hitting the same range, you know, 115, 113, and 112. Super consistent and all over 110. He has the second lowest break, even on this chart. And I think he has 
borderline top eight potential, certainly top 10. Slight downside is his three before his last three. He only delivered scores of 93, 69, 82, but overall has been very consistent and has a really nice floor. So do not mind the Wanganeen Miller selection. Lockie Whitfield, good to be relieved of a tagger this week and enjoy the extra freedom. 112 points, 31 touches, and an impressive 761 metres gain. So back to his damaging best. His price is good for potential, but same old story for me with Whitfield. I just feel that he'd be a stressful owner. The talent's there, though, and he's been a pretty successful pick to date. So keep him in your considerations if you're a fan and if you don't have a pacemaker. And uh, a quick GWS bonus on a couple of blokes that I haven't included. Uh, first one's Nick Haynes returning to a defensive role, scored 116 from 25 touches and 12 marks. He was a random primo for a year, what, a few years back, but really hasn't given a bark since then. And the other one's Harry Himmelberg, played his best game of the year with a 139. Nice stat line with 30 touches, 12 marks, but again, think this could be a bit of a flash in the pan. I only in a keeper draft, so... I know how inconsistent it can be. One I'd just stay away with from, sorry, to be honest, unless you know more about his role and prospects than I do. Uh, but back to the slides. The Gov, well, he's had a phenomenal year and he's sitting at a really nice price for potential. Same old story again. My concern for durability, it will always stay the same. I won't bore you with the numbers again about his games tally over the past five years, but if he stays fit, he could easily finish top six for averages. You know, 117 on the weekend, 23 touches, 8 marks, loves to intercept, has a nice kick to handball ratio, can take a nice contested mark as well. This year, he's really added consistency to his scoring, and I think a big reason, an obvious reason for that, is simply getting some continuity in his game, and he's remained relatively injury-free up until this point. You know the risks attached, but I just selected a 55-year-old Dane Zorko, so who am I to talk about age and durability? If you like him, and you want a decent pod with a nice ceiling, I think he can really go with the gov this week. Nice value. Uh, Jordan Clark, a player that's gone under the radar slightly. Massive score of 151 from 21 touches, 24 of those kicks. He also went at 82% efficiency, which was nice. We know that he has a good buy, but if you already own, say, Houston and Ryan or even a young, it just won't suit your structure. If you don't own two or more, then he's a pod that you could take a sniff at 85, 105, 63, and that 151 in his last four shows that he has been up and down the last month. But overall, if you look at his opening scores, he has had a consistent year. If you believe in him, you can go for it, but I'd prioritize other players ahead of him. Uh, Nicky Newman, owned by 1% of coaches, has a decent ceiling went on. Definitely a lone wolf move if you want to go there. Had the most kick-ins in a single game from a Carlton player this year, with seven in total on the weekend. Competing with McCoven and Boyd for those, so could just have been his week, you know, right place, right time maybe. But 148, 90 and 147 in the last three weeks. Sees him with a massive three-round average and one you should at least take a little look into if you need to make, say, a rapid rise, be a risk versus reward type move. Uh, Dan Houston, a brilliant buy this week. One of the best, I think, and also has that brilliant buy. After his first two sub-tons for the year, he went bang with a 148. What a game he played. Kicked three snags, could have been four. And for me, the most impressive thing was the fact that he delayed 10 tackles and really got his hands dirty. He's been right up there all year for defensive averages. Super consistent, has a nice floor. We just saw his ceiling. Wonderful use by foot. Always has that beautiful kick to handball ratio. There is so much like about this pick. And again, I think a super trading option this week. I'm extremely tempted. May jump on myself. I was really close to starting him. Just love the way that he goes about it. So two thumbs up for the Houston trade-in. Maxi Holmes. So he scored 104 on the weekend. Another solid performance. You'd probably prefer him over Stewart with the way things currently sit. 32 touches, 14 of those contested. Almost 800 metres gained, kicked a goal. Efficiency wasn't his friend, however, only went at 56%. I think that prevented, say, a 125. Look, he'll remain a pod, I think, for the entire season. So if you're looking to take a risk, again, like a McGovern maybe, but on, on a lower end, you know, jump the ranks, go away from the crowd, he may be the type of pick that appeals to you. Uh, she's actually passed the eye test me 
in the midfield on the weekend. He's spending a bit more time behind the ball rather than forward, which was nice. I still don't like this at all and wish he was playing down back. But on the weekend, he did some damage. 32 touches, 9 marks, 4 tackles, few clearances. More of an uncontested game, but did use the ball well at over 80% efficiency. Some are still looking to trade out, and I can see why. But I'd be taking Janeth's LDU approach and focus on getting rookies off the field rather than sidewaysing your primos, or at least until you're at full premium. If you've got the luxury to move him on and you want to, go for it. But he's already lost a lot of coin that he did make, and I'm hoping he can grow into the role. Certainly has a talent for it anyway. Uh, Hayden Young, a very up-and-down season, but was up again last week with 121 from 27 touches, 8 tackles. His last five scores read 114, 79, 94, 130, down or 65, almost doubles that to a 121. As I said, very up and down. So for me, he's just a watch at this stage, but another player with a nice buy if you don't currently own. Uh, my man Bailey Dale only scored the 88 and had a modest possession count this week. On a positive note, you know, if this is floor, it's pretty decent. And I'll take those games along with ceiling scores. He plays the Swannies this week, so I am super paranoid that James Jordan does a job on him, which will probably mean Bevo will move him to the forward line or something. Could be a tough watch this week. I'm just praying that JJ leaves my boy alone. Uh, Nicky Dacos, if you look at the raw stats alone from last week, 41 touches, 22 of those contested, five tackles. You'd be thinking 150 plus for sure, plus maybe a little bit more. Unfortunately for King Nick, he had 11 Muppets and his kicking efficiency was garbage. If a few more of those kicks hit the target, this could have been really, really big. But we've all got him by now, so good to see he's in full flight again. Another monster is only around the corner. And again, I think we can rely on him to be in our VC and captaincy loops now. Uh, Nicky Martin has a love-hate relationship with his own fans. I can tell you that being there on the weekend. He either butchers a ball or hits a teammate, lace out with a bullet. We see the good, the bad, the ugly. But luckily, he gets enough of the ball. Scored 100 on the dot from 27 touches. A slight concern was that he was moved forward in the last quarter for memory. So we don't want to see that. At the price, I think you can wait on him. But he does have a very juicy matchup this week against a depleted Tigers side. And Lukey Ryan, the Peroxide King, let us down the weekend with 122. And look, that sounds harsh, let us down. But most owners had the VC on him, and we're after a monster. We didn't get that, but as usual, had a couple of big quarters, had some hot patches, and made his way to, well, what was still a good score. One of the toughest non-owns in the comp. Now with his high break-even, I'd just wait for his price to go down again, jump on possibly after his buy, but he has gone 110 plus in eight of his 10 games this year. That's an elite floor, an elite ceiling. He's also had scores of, you know, where are we? 165, 145, and a 197. So you've just got to get this man in when you can. On to the defenders, 250 to 500k. And at the top, we have Blake Hardwick. Played the game of his life, scoring a career high 180 points from 23 touches, 18 of those kicks. And he also had the most contested possessions for the Hawks, laid four tackles, had four frees, four, and best of all, kicked a bag of five sausage rolls. That's seen his break even go very low, and some people are actually considering. There's no way I could go there, but if he somehow scores 100 plus this week against my boys, then it's almost a slight win already. I'd just much rather prefer upgrading to a true premium or downgrading to a rookie elsewhere if you're looking for cash. He's a player that could give you the best of both worlds. But the question is, can that world ever become reality? It could, but personally, I'm not backing on it. But if you like him, go with your gut. Um, McKercher out again, so frustrating for owners. He's got coin to make, should continue to score well, but he's coming back from injury, may give him a slight sub-risk when he does return because we know that they want to risk him, uh, you know, overwork him. He's just too important for them. Spills and Janeth have both traded him out, so... I'd probably look to follow suit and jump off. Just so sad. But in saying that, you can hold if you can't afford to bench him. Uh, Graham just not getting a game at the moment. So for me, it's getting to the point where I'm thinking of moving him on. If you've got other players that are ready to cull, then keep on to him as a loot for now. But at the same time, I think you can feel free to get rid of him and get some coin in the bank for an upgrade. 
Uh, Compen really reset his break even after two solid weeks. Of course, when I trade him out, uh, scored an 80 on the weekend. A certain hold for now. You can also utilize his DPP with a few blokes now, which is handy. Taking some nice intercept marks, using the ball pretty well. And job security is as solid as it gets. Uh, poor old Sam Close. He did a lot of unrewarded running on that dead wing last week. Even when he switched sides, sowed the ball. It was just one of those nights for him. Scored a 40 which he basically doubled the week before, but it wasn't his fault. And that's why we traditionally don't like the wing roll for Supercoach. There can be lots of unrewarded efforts. And look quickly on another son who I haven't included, Mac Andrew, had a massive clanger to give the Cats their first goal, but then showed his courage and brilliance a minute later with a spectacular mark. It was actually from a closey hospital kick from memory. So well done to him. But yeah, for Mac, a poor score in the 50s this week. Uh, now on to Jack Crisps. We have found a pod here, people. An obvious shift in role has seen Crispy find, well, what is it? It's pretty much a new lease on life, isn't it? Playing through that midfield. In the last three weeks, his CBAs have spiked dramatically with 68%, 79%, and then a season high 81% last week. His scores have reflected the increase as well. Was averaging 73 for the season before this spike. Then his last three scores have been 106, 134, and 112. So that's a three round average of 117. Available at under 500k, has DPP status. Super pod, basically no ownership in the top 1%. The issue is can you trust his role? In last three, he's averaging 27 touches, eight tackles, 0.7 goals per game. So there is a lot to like if you think the role and the CBA rate continues. Lone wolf style, but certainly method to the madness. Uh, Bonner, he's an easy hold, still rewarding owners. Kudos to you if you starred him and you've kept on to him this far. Uh, Blake Howes is a chop or a hold. If you have him on field, I think he's certainly a chop because I know that he was costing me too many points here in that spot, but not desperate need as the break even could be achievable if you've just got him on the bench. 53 points from 13 touches on the weekend. I think that's probably... Around the marker, he's going to score. Uh, Zach Williams, 11 touches, including a goal, bit of time up forward. All those 11 touches were kicks, which is nice. A few tackles thrown in there to score a 61, but just not doing enough on field and want to move on when you want. And Tommy Stewart, wow, we, wow, we put in another disappointing performance. And now there's many coaches that are starting to question his top six defensive credentials, and rightly so. I even questioning top 10 at the moment. Things just aren't clicking for Tommy. And to be honest, I think it was even overscored the last couple of weeks. You know, Long was playing a defensive role on him, which didn't help his cause. But let's be honest, Benny Long is no superstar. He's always been a little bit of a battler. All respect to Benny. A ridiculous, insufficient free kick was paid against Stewart early on. I've gotten the notes. And yeah, that well, that pretty much set the scene for this game. He's now priced at under 500 k for the first time since round 16, 2020. Well, that shows A, how consistent he's been for so long, and B, it shows how out of form he actually is. Surely you'd think the man regains some type of form again, but with the way things sit, players like the Fish are putting their hands up for a selection over him. So Tommy needs to do a fair bit in the next couple of weeks to actually get in some sides before we actually start to complete this defensive line. So come on, Stewie. You're on limited time here, mate. On to the defenders under 250k. And not great reading here this week, but next week we'll take a look at Ethan Phillips and co. We have Leek Lee. He continues to sit at the top of the list, but can't get a game. Not much we can do there. Lloyd Johnson played well in front of his home crowd, but I'm not really sure on his job security. If you know more about him, then go for it. Janet did talk about him in the rookie data dump on the Swordplay Potty this week. That's timestamp, so feel free to check that out if you like, but he is on the bubble, but I'll be passing this week. Uh, Tobias Pink played a forward role, kicked an early goal, missed an easy one as well, but not much more apart from that. Hold, but don't invest. And Josh Draper, 13 points from 87% TOG, gives him the poo symbol this week, but oh, I've been pretty nice. I've given him the chop there instead, or the watch. So I'm being kind to you, Joshy, but another game like that, and the poo symbol is going to stay there for the next fortnight. On to the midfielders, 500k plus. And at the top, yes, we have old man Pendles. He's just a beast, this bloke. How good is he? One of the unluckiest players, in my opinion, not to win a brown low. He just keeps getting better. His break even sits at 33 after scores of 106, 106, 
147 and 118 last week. I still couldn't go there due to the fact that he's a mid only, but you need to give respect where respect's due. And he's playing some vintage Pendles football at the moment. If you're a Pies supporter and you play for fun, chuck him in his side. But I don't think we can grab him when we've got so many other better options this year. Uh, LDU, what a day it was for owners. I watched him live and he was lighting it up early, killing the clearances, running on the ground really well. He had that real hunger back and really tried to carry the ruse on Sunday. 27 touches, used the ball really well. Also managed to kick a couple of snags, which got him to that ceiling score. You can see my brother Janet in the symbol section there because he has him, oh, I'll tell you, I'm so glad for him. If you haven't checked out the Swordplay pod, Check out Janeth's rank, top 300 at the moment. So really wrap for Janeth because he's been really big on holding on to his premiums and trying to keep the faith with his premiums. And he was really rewarded last week. And he's just held him throughout the entire season. And that's why I'm so happy. Rewarded for loyalty. 101, 112, 90, 109, and 152 in his last five. That sees him hitting form. He's a big pod. Someone's got the talent to be around the top 10 mark. It may not be his year in 2024 to do that. But remember, back to his post by average from 2023 last year. Very, very impressive. So take a look if you want to join my man, Janeth. Uh, Chad Warner, what a game from the young man, transforming into an absolute superstar of the comp, taking his game to the next level. 15 goals this season, another three on the weekend. Kicked a goal in every game bar one. And that's what I think is taking Sydney to the next level as a team. These goal-kicking midfielders, 28 touches, 10 contested, 4 tackles to go along with those 4 snags. Such an exciting play to watch as well, so it would be really fun to own. Adam Trelaw, we featured him last week. And he just keeps on going. If only I could trust his body, I'd be all over him as a pod. So I'm not going to go through the numbers. But if you think that he can get through the season unscathed, then take a deep dive into him. Oh, it's really impressive. I wish that I could, but I just can't. Uh, Matty Crouch just keeps on keeping on. Amazing that some Crow supporters on X were calling for his head this year. I think he's been fantastic. We know what his limitations are, but... He's holding his head high. On the weekend, scored 121 against Pies. Nine kicks, 25 handballs, seven tackles. Disposal pig, but obviously a little bit handball happy. Only 65% tog doesn't help, but that also shows how good his points per minute are. I've got the rock-solid symbol there on him, and that's the best way I can describe him. Should have probably had the clock on there for low tog as well, but yeah, certainly keep that in mind. Uh, Clary, pass your test again on the weekend. So he was a top scorer from the Ds, 124 points. They came from 26 touches, which is still low for his usual pick standards, but 20 were contested, also laid another eight tackles. His TOG is at 79%, so hopefully that can increase more as the season progresses. I think you can feel free to bring Clary in if you think he's turned the corner. Zachy Butters. It was not looking good for the great man at three-quarter time, and those that chucked the C on him would have been a little bit nervous, but then he just decides to elevate to another dimension in the last and just carry his team over line for an epic victory. 17 touches, five clearances in the final turn alone. 17 and five just in the last quarter. So end of the day, his tally was 32 touches, six tackles, eight clearances. So that just goes to show how much damage he did when it really mattered in the last, when the game was really on line. He's also second for meters gained at Port behind Farrell, 127 points for his efforts. And at the end of the day, got a great buy. He's a bloke that's fun to have on his side. He's shown enough to prove that he's an Uber this year. And if Shields doesn't give him too much of a hard time this week, he could go absolutely nuts. So love owning Zach Butters. Uh, Jordan Dawson, 48, 53, and 56% CBAs in the last three. That doesn't feel with great confidence, but he's scoring well. 107 from 29 touches and second and seven tackles. But again, it's the efficiency that's letting him down. Only went at 65%. Uh, Track had a quiet game with an 87, just 20 touches and one snag. Not his night after dominating the week before. You can still grab him if you like, but now the decision is Track v Clary. Do you go with the cement bag or do you go with the piggy? Your decision, very, very tough one. Obviously share the same buy. And last one we've got here is Noah Anderson scored a game high 149 points in one of the better games I've seen him play. 
Field up the stat sheet, 42 touches, 4 tackles, a couple of snags to boot, a little bit up and down, but his ups may be enough to sway you his way. Jack Steele, only the 86 points after a couple of hundred plus scores, did lay 8 tackles, but only had the 5 kicks. I'm still not sure 100% what's going on with his knee, if it's giving him major troubles or not, but something does worry me about him. I wouldn't be jumping off, but I wouldn't be jumping on. Neil, low, huge, low, huge in last month. Scores of 71 up to 168. Daniel, 79 up to 162. You either lose big or win big with Lockie at the moment. Before that 71, though, every score was over 100. So it has been a consistent year for him. And I think he's actually flying under the radar. Only owns by 4% of the competition. He could definitely be an option after his buy. So one to track for sure. And here's a big one for this week. It's Matty Rao. Actually think he was underscored, but hit back with 128 from 35 touches, 10 tackles, and a goal. Led the way with close to a game-high contested possession count, and it was just a fantastic all-round performance. The only thing that stopped him from pumping out 140-plus was his efficiency, which was only at 68%. Bose was manning up on him at times during the stoppages, but had zero effect. Good to see Rally back in form after a couple of very lean weeks by his 2024 standards. I think he's a fantastic trading option this week. If he didn't ruin my buy structure, I'd bring him in in a heartbeat. I'm just spewing because I can't, and he's an absolute bargain for what he can and should produce from here on out. So if you don't own Muddy Rao and you need a midfielder and he suits your buy structure, feel free to bring him in without any hesitation, in my opinion. Uh, Caleb Sarong, well, again, this man just keeps on keeping on. When other mids are failing, he just keeps delivering this bloke up there with my best trade into the season. No discussion needed here. I'll just leave you with his season scores to date. 170, 141, 125, 94, 110, 117, 140, 137, 150, and 118. Elite in every sense of the word. He'll cost you, but he is worth every penny and his price here for a reason. Sam Walsh kicked an early goal, which was nice, but was being blanked by James Jordan. Copped a nice tag. Uh, but oh, I just hate hate owning Sam Walsh. But anyway, he's a player that will keep on trying. But after his red hot start to the season with that 166 and 130, he's gone 104, 91, 119, and 85, which is pretty um, underwhelming for a so-called premium midfielder. So I wouldn't be investing, to be honest. But at the same time, it wouldn't surprise me to see him pick things up. And I hope that he does, obviously, as an owner. Uh, the Bond, a modest sounding for the great man with a modest CBA can. I was so confident, so confident pre-season when I did that review that he wouldn't go under the ton more than once for the year, but already by round 10, I've been proven wrong on that. Looks like I was a little bit too confident on the pick. A 93 isn't an absolute disaster, but not what we want from a so-called captain choice, the uber, uber elite. We need to keep in mind that he was being tagged by Ward for periods, so... You can look at this as a positive if you've got a half glass, an ass, geez, a glass half full approach. But I'll never lose faith in Bond. I know that I may have a little bit of blind vision at the moment because I love the man so much. But I truly think another big score is only around the corner. Just, just a little sniff away, I think, from the Bond. Uh, Rory Laird, 17 handballs, but only the five kicks. 13 of his touches were contested, but only the two tackles. No need to invest here at the moment. I just think it's too dangerous. And Zeret, well, this is an interesting one this week. Well, last week, I watched him live. He was tagged by Liam Shields and just couldn't deliver a triple-figure score. Super frustrating to watch. Did kick a nice goal in the first quarter, but only had the three touches. That still got him to 29 points, but again, he started to slow down scoring-wise. Ended up on 94 from 21 touches, but only five of those were kicks. And this is bad. We know that his kicking is his weapon. His break-even's high, but he's got the perfect opponent this week. So it's a really awkward situation as a potential buyer. Do you pay up this week knowing his price could plummet if he does have an ordinary game for some reason, but also know that he could give you an absolute monster? Do you just wait until he's available to lower price? I can't answer that for you, but selfishly, as an owner myself, I am very glad that I don't have to make that decision. And last one here we've got is Josh Dunkley. Another solid performance with 115 from 26 touches and 5 tackles. With the upcoming buy, my suggestion would be to hold out until after his buy and then look to inject him into your team if you're looking for 
Let's call him a reliable type of pod. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500k. At the top, we have Jeremy Sharp. This man has found form again and can be trusted on field if you need him, I think. 89 from 20 touches and a snag. Hold for now, and I think you can even hold through the buys if you want. However, a dud score and his break-even will start to rise again, so the decision may be taken out of our hands, depending on what he does. Tom Green, for me, is one of the best buys of the year at this price, and I would be jumping all over him as a non-owner. You've been really kissed here, given his injury score. He can match up with the best of the best on his day. He's an absolute bull. I've normally got the green bull symbol there because that's exactly what he is. Loves a contested pill. Admittedly, he's been a little bit up and down, but there have been reasons for that. And his best is very hard to ignore. Two 130-plus scores and two 150-plus scores. That's evidence of that ceiling. But at the same time, he has put out three sub-tons, four if you include that injury score of five, which I think is a little bit harsh. But if you're a non-owner, I think this is going to be a great buy for the week. Uh, Dugowie, he's currently injured, so scrap him off your list for now. Uh, and Georgie Hewitt, he's a sell at his current break-even, 163, very much in the red. I just think it's best to get in an uber premium, such as your Matty Rao, while he still holds some value. And as you can see there, we have raised $120 so far for the Royal Children's Hospital, the Good Friday Appeal. If you are interested in helping to donate towards that, pick up yourself a Supercoach Swordplay beanie. You'll be able to find them at supercoachswordplay.com, along with, well, what have we got? Everything these days, hoodies, merch, notebooks, uh, the, the works, it's... About 3.30 here at the moment, so uh, let's just get to the next slide. But check out supercoachswordplay.com. On to the midfielders, under 250k. And at the top, we have Joel, I'm going to butcher this, Frasier, Frasier. I don't know how to pronounce it. So I'm just going to call him Jolly Boy. But he is an interesting bubble boy this week. Priced at 117k with bonus DPP. Subbed off for 64 points in what seemed like a pretty decent performance. But that rings alarm bells in itself. Never like to see sub risks. His efficiency was pretty poor at only 58%, but 10 out of his 12 touches were kicks. And he had 384 metres game, which is pretty good for his possession count. Scored a 63 the week before against the Tigers, so his scoring seems pretty consistent for now. Janet doesn't mind him as a selection. We did deep dive into him in the sword play potty this week. Is it Jolie Boy? Is it Richards? Well, the choice is yours. I'll talk about Richards when we get to the forward line, but if you're preferring someone that's got DPP for a little bit more flexibility through the buys, then it may sway your Joel's way. Do you trust Bevo? I'm not sure, but a pretty talented type player. If you like him and if you've got a good read, I think he's a fine trading option this week. Uh, Kane McAuliffe finally burst his bubble with his third game, scored a respectable 62 in a demolition and... Uh, look, still at a fair and reasonable price, I'd call it. We all know about the Richmond injury list, so you'd assume he keeps his spot for now. When players start to return, he may make his way out again, but surely he gets another couple after a pretty solid performance this week. In round five against, what was that, West Coast, he scored a 58. So pretty consistent in his two major games, not counting the sub game. If you need a mid, you don't rate Jolly Boy, then you could get him... I'm just not too sure. I don't rate him at the top of the list, but I certainly think that he could be a realistic option. Uh, Lockie Sullivan scored the 51 points, which was slightly disappointing because he was on 25 at quarter time. Too late to jump on now, but he's got more cash to make if he continues to get games. And quickly, other Collingwood players in Sidey and Finn McRae, who I didn't feature. Sidey, I'll call Trap, and it seems that way for now. 13 touches at 76%. That just won't cut the mustard. And McRae is a pass at the price for me. Couldn't back things up. 12 touches at 66% efficiency for 51 points on the weekend. And last man here on the slide is Josh Sin. For me, he's a pod bubble pass. I don't see many jumping on this week. But if he keeps his spot, he's got a decent pie, which is something that's going for him. And I better mention these beautiful looking roosters down here at the bottom. We've got the Supercoach Wall of Fame. So I've got my man H. Jono, Twadzi, George, Damo, Kata, and Tim Michelle. Thank you very, very much for your support, guys. You're a massive part of our community. And a special shout out to Jono Carroll. He started up his own Supercoach channel. So, St. Binger Supercoach, be sure to check that out. Give him a sub. He's a great man. And I'd really love if you could show him some support because, as I mentioned, a very special part of our community. Good on you, Jono. Well done, son. 
On to the big boys in the ruck, and I tell you what, I was spewing with Vicentini for taking sweet spot. Well, I suppose it's not his fault. I'll blame Kenny instead. Actually scored okay with a 94 from only eight touches, but got bullied by Meek at times and surely makes way for Jordan. It's possible with Dixon out that they could play both, but if they go with one main ruck, I think Sweetie has to come in. And speaking of Sweet, if he's named this week, he's such an easy hold. If not, not be gobsmacked then we've got a big decision on our hands, particularly if you've got him at R2. But it's now disaster zone if you've taken a donut and he's out. However, I don't think we're going to have to worry this week. As I said, I'd be super surprised if he didn't make his way in. Uh, Ned Moyle has to be... Oh, he can't be a Gold Coast next year, can he? He's got to be a number one ruck in the AFL club. With Captain Witts having such a firm grasp on that at the Suns, I think you need to look for opportunities elsewhere in 2025. 104 points from 17 touches, and every single one of those was contested. This bloke is a beast. Had 42 hitouts, dominated the Geelong Rucks. So this could have been a mini monster score if he didn't give the six free kicks away. Toby Conway, another impressive game. And I tell you what, the Squadfather traded this bloke in as a bit of a pod move. And actually, when I say a bit, a huge pod move. Got a fair bit of the ball with 21 touches, but the most impressive thing was that 18 of those were contested, and that was a game high. So Moyle and Conway absolutely smashing that contested pill. So he really did stake his claims, Toby Conway. Five frees did help his cause. This is five frees four, but his low efficiency of 52% prevented him from hitting, let's just say, a 110 plus. Unfortunately, I don't think you could bring him in. The ship sailed on this one. I'm not entirely sure about his job security moving forward. But again, if he floats your boat, then go for your life. Raul Marshall, this man is a monster. Crucifying those that trade him out for sweet. Super bad luck if you did. After producing scores of 51 and 63 in round 6 and 7, where his ownership dipped from 10% down to 6%, he's livid those that stuck that with him. Scores of 107, 164, and 169. What a great way to say thanks. He's clearly the best buy here if you're looking for a ruck this week. I'm not too sure how many people are looking at a ruck for this week, but he's just in fine form. Fine form. You know, you look at his break even. There's question marks over other rucks. The only thing I suppose with Marshall is that he's shouldering a big load, but judging from last three weeks, it's not worrying him too much. So if you need a ruck this week, he's your man for sure. Remember to check your buy structures. So Lloyd Meek just keeps on producing great scores and again, rewarding those who traded him in early on. A super move, 112 from 18 touches, 12 of those contested, laid four tackles, had 45 hitouts, a really easy hold for... I'm going to say the near future or until he starts to or if he starts to drop off. But I say back him in. And in current form, he's actually scoring better than English. Uh, Grundy, I say this, I've said this with a couple of people, but he just keeps on keeping on. A terrible trade out for me. Had a game high 15 contested possessions. He did give away four frees, which hurt him. Only went at 66% efficiency. But a great hold for those who stuck fat. Another 117 points in the brank for Brody. And what you'll notice, again, with lots of the rucks this week, is that they led the way for contested possessions. We'll talk about Dogger Jackson when we get to the forward line, but look what Rowan did, Conway, Moyle. Just a fantastic effort from the big guys. Uh, Cherry, well, some are thinking of jumping off and joining the Rowan train. His break-even is sitting pretty high, but he has had a great season. There's no real urgency to trade, in my opinion, anyway. It's all good if you want to jump off, but... Either way, you've won out with, with Sherry, I think. Maxi Gorm, again, super disappointing this week. And look, we we can't be too disappointed with the 109, but most of us were expecting a monster against BJ Williams, and he was the most popular captaincy choice this week. Hopefully he can get, bounce back for us, but yeah, something's just been a little bit off in the last three weeks. We're not seeing that massive ceiling, which we've been accustomed to this year so far. And Timmy English, he's had a lean couple of weeks, says Timmy, which sees his break even rise again. We've just talked about Marshall, and he's putting his hand up over English for our services at the moment. The value keeps switching between the two. So in a couple of weeks, Timmy will be at a really friendly price if he keeps it, this up. And it may be time to pounce then. 
For now, I think we just leave him to drop a little bit more, watch him closely. Only 13 touches last week, which is low for him, and a modest 35 for his effort. So not overly impressed with what he's doing at the moment, but we know what he can do, and he's the type of player that can really hurt you when he's on fire. On to the forwards, 500k plus. Oh, Phil Froners, Isaac Rankin, a phenomenal game that was close to perfection up until the final moments of this game when he pulled his hammy. Super bad luck for those that went there because it was an inspired selection. 30 touches, 16 contested, kicked a snag, laid five tackles for 125 points. The roll was good, had 59% CBAs, which was double his average in the last three weeks. Now likely to be out for three weeks, so I can't give you advice on whether or not you should look to trade. The decision is completely up to you. But... Oh, well, look, 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 I will then. If it was two weeks, I would hold, but three, I'm most likely moving on, assuming trades aren't an issue, but it's a really difficult decision. Janeth was talking about him in the potty last night, and what really hurts is his upcoming fixture. That's a big reason as to why Janeth did purchase him for his next three fixtures, but unfortunately, he's going to be out, plays on more, has a buy, and then the fixture does get a lot harder after that. So I really do feel for owners, but... Given his injury, given it's a three-week time frame, it could even blow out to four. Who knows? I think you just got to move him on. Too much coin to have on the bench. Uh, bad luck, bad luck. Uh, the magician, Dane Zorko, well, absolutely feasted last week. Delivered for me on debut. I was wrapped for this. I've got a big smile on my face. I'll tell you what, his status for mine has now upgraded to a must-have. Unfortunately, you'll probably have to be after the buy. You're really paying up now. The play was to get him in last week. 161 from 35 touches, 15 marks. Kicked a snagged as well. Went at 85% efficiency. Took 40-odd percent of the kick-ins for that extra bonus cherry on top of his super coach pie. And we all love that seagull-type role. I think you need him in at some stage. His last three scores... 160, 117, and 161 would certainly suggest that anyway. Jake Waterman is, without doubt, the surprise packet of the year. I can't believe this. I can't get my head around it, but the numbers speak for themselves. A top six average and dominating the key backs. The new version of the Dree Train and another banger of 142, 17 touches, 13 marks, and five goals. This man is unstoppable, and... Although I keep saying not to go there, I can't go there, I'm just going to stop saying that now because if you like him, then go for it. It's hard to fathom, but I'm super happy for the bloke and obviously he's been working extremely hard to improve his game, but I'll never be able to do it myself. Uh, Nettie Flanders continued his dominant super coach run with another great score of 127. Again, not much discussion needed with this pick because he is an absolute must-have. Just doesn't fail this guy. Season scores. 124, 128, 102, 125, 116, 110, 105, 128, 108, and 127. That shows you exactly why it's a must-have non-negotiable pick. One of very few that has not gone below the ton all year. Every score has been in triple figures. And think of some of the superstars in the game that haven't been able to achieve that. Most of our big midfielders. So I say get him in now if you're one of the few teams that haven't. Still boggles the mind that Stewie Jew was leaving this guy to rot in the VFL. Just, yeah, amazing stuff. He is a superstar. Isaac Heaney, it's the same old story each week. I must have, on the weekend, 121 points from 24 touches, 8 tackles, 3 sausage rolls. And speaking about rolls, he is an absolute Rolls Royce and deserves to have a brown low around his neck by season end. 623,900. Oh, look, that, that's still a decent price, I think, for Isaac. And Dylan Moore, he's hit the floor, and I was worried about this. He does have a low floor. In the last couple of weeks, just has not gone well. All of a sudden, looking like a worrying selection, so owners will be hoping that he hits back hard against the Lions. In the last two weeks, he's actually had his two highest CBA rates for the year. But unfortunately, for one reason or another, it just hasn't translated into good Supercoach scores. 66 points from 16 touches... One behind and six Muppets is not what we want. So no way that we invest in this stage. But as an owner, I think you just hold for now. We can see it's gone from green arrow to red arrow. But hopefully that can flip on its head and we'll start to get some good scores again. 
On to the forwards, 250 to 500k. And at the top of the list, we have the sexy man. He's risen from the dead with lovely 118 to follow up that 80 plus from the week before. What a godsend he's been, particularly for those teams who are struggling for cash gen. A game high, 837 metres gained from 32 touches and 10 marks. Only the five contested, but did go over 80% efficiency, which was lovely. Has a great roll down back for Supercoach, a good distributor, and seems to have worked on those deficiencies that Dimmer was alluding to. His DPP status allows him to be moved down back, or up forward, and if you're a Combin or Fisher owner, this is the perfect link. And speaking about Fisher, he plays a sickening role. Oh my goodness. We were watching it first hand, Spills and I, and it looks like he's his, it's his roles to keep. We have already talked about Shees, and Fisher's taken that role with open arms, which has been reflected in his spike and average. It was definitely the week to jump on last week, but at his current price, I think we can still go there either as that defensive stopgap or potentially a forward premium keeper with top six potential from here on out with the roll. You can see the seagull symbol there, as well as the buy now. I can't believe I'm saying that, but since being gifted this roll, he scored 95, 140, and 116, taking kick-ins, getting the cheapies. There is a lot to like. Even if you don't rate him as the most talented player, it's a gold mine in the north back line for points, and Fish is loving every mind of it. 31 touches and 11 marks on the weekend. And he now has a break-even of zero. Very, very tempting. And I'm 50-50 about the Fish v Houston this week. And I'm running out of time to decide. So I need to make that decision very, very quickly. Uh, Sam Darcy followed up his 110-plus score last week with an 84. So glad I kept him. He'll be such an elite player when he hits his peak. I say the same thing every week. But this bloke just really, really impresses me. He'll be close to unstoppable in the air, in my opinion. Has a reach lock, not many others do. Just continue to get stronger and stronger. Such a scary matchup already. But no need to trade him whatsoever with his low break even. I don't love his matchup against the Swans this week. So given the fact he has the first game, you may want to loop him if you can. But he's been such an awesome cash cow that just keeps on giving. Riley Garcia scored 51 points from the 12 touches. Didn't really make much of an impact and low efficiency didn't help his cause. Kyle Lohman, let's talk about this bloke. A career best game for the young man, and did he celebrate hard? Copped a little bit of flack for that, which I think is absolutely ridiculous there. But we've got the sword play symbol, because we flagged there that he would be a great on-field option last week. If you took that advice, you would have been a big winner. An easy hold after kicking five goals for 128 points. Really stepped up, particularly in the absence of Link McCarthy. Remember, it was that big sub risk, but since Link has gone, that has just really solidified his spot in the 22 now. And the data suggests that he scores a lot better in wins. So when the lines go well, so does Mr. Lohman. Oli Dempsey, well, he picked up 25 touches, so pretty nice game from him, but only went at 60% efficiency. Mid-70 scores is fine for him, so... You can chop if you like, but I still think that Ollie's got a little bit of life left in him. This man here. Wow, we thank you very much for this week, mate. Dogger Jackson finally went back again with Oh, what well, where do I start here? It, it's been such a massive dry spell. Such a massive dry spell. Many people jumped off him when he hit his peak price, and that was a play I was looking at. But now his season average is back in the three-figure range. And with sweet out. He's been fantastic cover. I did say when Shrek came back earlier this year that it would only be a matter of time before Shrek was injured again, and that came to fruition. He finally capitalised on this dog at R1. That covered at R1 spot in the Ferro lineup. He was a contested animal. Both Rowan and Dogger smashed it out of the park. His DPP status is absolutely invaluable, and it's really saved my bacon on a few occasions now. He's got the great buy, but the downside now is that when Shrek comes back against Collingwood, he resumes his role as a key forward. Sad, but we always knew what we were buying here. 25 touches, 25, 21 sorry, of those contested on the weekend. Only three kicks, but still very impressive. Six tackles, 39 hitouts, and 10 clearances. 154 points for his efforts. And he really helped me to gain another rise in the overall ranks. So nice work, Dogger. Absolutely loved your performance, mate. And we've got Harley Reid here, who 
Just slapped four Maronis, didn't he? Slapped them in the face with the career best game. Dominated in every facet. Kicked one of the goals of the year. A double Oliver Petraka fend off in the same play. It was just mind-blowing to witness this man in action. Dominated the more mature Melbourne bodies and just made them look silly at times. Now, remember after his last monster score, he had two quiet games. So he does have the potential to drop off again, but... This will really increase his confidence. Not that he really needs it, let's be honest. And he's pretty much now reset his break even. 21 touches with half of those contested at 90%. Almost every possession had a big impact. Had seven clearances, laid four tackles, also kicked two lovely goals. So if you held, congratulations. Well done. But if you traded, commiserations. In saying that, I got Zorko in for him. So still happy with that move and I'm going to count that as a win. Tommy Pio had a pretty solid game, and watching him live, he actually passed the eye test for me. 90 points from 26 touches, an even kick to handball ratio, had his highest CBA count for the last month with 54%, which was handy for owners. I still wouldn't be investing as other options are putting their hand up, but at the same time, he's very easy hold for now. Grian Myers, I talked about how I was surprised with Mr. Waterman. Also very surprised here. He was the top scorer for Geelong on the weekend, and he's averaging in the top eight forwards. Super impressive. Elite ball. And look, when I say super impressive, the forward crop isn't great this year. But still, very, very nice from Grian Myers. Has elite footy IQ. We all know that he's a goal assist king. Never wastes a ball going inside 50. He'll hit targets that no one knew ever existed, this guy. He is so good. 119 points from 29 touches, couple of snags, almost 600 metres gamed, impressive tog, 90%. If you're after a pod, you could go worse than Myers, but it's definitely one for lone wolves, and you can't deny the potential for the pick, though. I couldn't do it myself. Darcy Wilson. All of a sudden, we're seeing a break even in the 70s for the young gun, but that is expected at the price. That's what we've got to remember here. He's currently priced at 416700 So that means that, unfortunately, if he does have another stinker, it may get close to a Robert situation or similar to that, where we're simply forced to let him go. But if he gets it to an Uber, you can still say goodbye to him this week. Just personally, I want to hold on to him. I like his next two fixtures. So I'm going to probably hold and then I'll reassess. He's still very reliable on field, in my opinion, but there is that risk that if he scores low, you will need to trade him out the next week. But still, I think that break in even is still looking pretty safe for mine. You know, three-rounder of 97, the break even's very much in green. So I'm holding the faith with Darcy, hoping he can give me a nice on-field score this week. Jai Caldwell also played a solid game with a 103 from 25 touches, five tackles, nine clearances. The only run real failure in the last month was a 58, but everything else has been good. He's got a nice role. He's hard at it, loves a contest. I see him in that mix for a, say, an F6 to 10 average for sure. Parrish is out again now, which helps him. So if you're after a pod and he suits your buy structure, I think he could go a lot worse than Caldwell, especially as Rankin is now off the table. For the time being, anyway. Nat Fife, he's gone from, uh, what, how would you, let's say, hero to zero in the last few weeks. The discussion has changed from trading him in to now trading him out. After his 119 in round seven, he's given us a 17, a sub, a 60, and a 63. Literally, he's three lower scores for the year. He's lost a fair bit of coin last week, so my play is, is just to probably hold for decent cover through the buys and hope to see a ceiling type game to get that cash gen going again. The role's still there, but the red flags with the risk of being rested along with his dodgy durability history will always be there with Fife. If you want to move him on, I think that's fine, but it's also a fine play to hold him for the short term. In saying that, another score in, say, the 60 range will have me pretty concerned, but yeah, I need him to, to really deliver this week. Jack McRae, he scored a 92 from 23 touches. Half of those were contested, but again, there are other blokes that excite me more. I see him, and nothing personal, and hate to offend former Supercoach royalty, but I see him as a bit of a nothing, you know, wasted type pick. You know, get him in if you disagree, but he's just not for me. 
Uh, Charlie Kuno, one we can wait on, I think, until after the buys. 71 last week from a couple of goals. Only went at 57% efficiency, which didn't help the cause. Shea Bolton, another average score. 75 for him. Well, 75 is actually his best score, I think, in the last month. But I've got no interest in this man at the moment. But if he's still sitting around, say, 400k at his buy, he could be that perfect, for perfect luxury F7 with that big ceiling to loop. You love those blokes to have on your bench that have a really, really big ceiling. You know they will usually have a low floor as well, but that's the beauty of looping them. You don't have to take their score. I haven't actually checked out you know, times or days, dates with his fixture to see if he's actually going to be a good loop, but that's something that I will look into and something you can consider anyway. He did peak at 561K in round seven, and that was after scores of 119, 133, and 129. But then the roller coaster went right down at a rapid pace with scores of 67, 36, 59, and 75 last week. So you'll pretty much find the roller coaster symbol next to this fella every week because that's exactly what he is. The lesson here is never pay up full tote for Shea. And Eric Cadman, for me, is an absolute must trade out. A break even of 106. It's the same as Bolton's, but 251,500. He's leaking cash very, very quickly. So my best play would be to get a Dodgeville while you can. Just be thankful for what you've made and say goodbye to the man. Get out of my side. And as always, we will finish off with the forwards under 250k. I will skip Joe Richards for a sec. We'll get back to him. Uh, Sam Day had a bit of a day out, pun intended. Or was it a night game? No, that's what I get for trying to be clever anyway. But it's a clever decision to bring him in. I'm not too sure. He scored a 75 from seven touches, three marks, and three goals. He's a definite pod, but I think lots of us already have a fair few Gold Coast players. And there are other players from that Suns team that I'd prefer to target over day. If you believe in his role moving forward and think he can continue to have an impact and impact the scoreboard, then he could be a small shout, but just not for me. Brucey Revel, come on down, Brucey. Did exactly what I expected. Didn't get much of it, but used it really well. Played that wing spot for a while, just didn't get near him for periods. But the most pleasing thing for me was when Klugger got subbed, Brucey actually went into the CBA rotation. A solid score in the 70s, and looking like the better pick than Sullivan for now anyway. As I said last week, super versatile, can play anywhere. That bodes well for his job security. His DPP will also come in really handy. But again, I think you've missed the boat here. He's got the buy next week. Then we get a couple of players back. So last week was the week to jump on if you really wanted Brucey. I was close to including David Swallow in last week's stocky due to his basement price. But form in the sub vest really made me wait another week to feature him. But after a 98 from 19 touches and a couple of goals, we need to give him some recognition and at least have a quick convo. Now, he has a break even in negative 25, and amazingly for a player of his talent, he's priced under 200K. His other scores to date, however, read. And this is why we're not gonna get too excited here, because that 98 was his best score this season by a country mile. His other scores to date, 57, 51. Don't worry, it gets worse. 38, 14, 35, 7, 8, and 36. So it's a no from me, but I could see a world where this works. Spent a lot of time in the midfield, which was a very positive sign. He can actually make some nice coin if he keeps it up, but will he keep it up? I'm not trusting this after the one big score. Just the, those four scores just worry me too much. Uh, Logan Morris, well, had a solid game against the Tigers. A real fine for Lions, but again, I think the ship has sailed here. Hugo Garcia isn't getting a game at the moment, so hold or loop or chop, whatever you need. Hopefully he comes back, though. Connor Stone, probably past me, so not a heap of discussion needed here. Gallagher is, well, I'll tell you what, you look at this, at the stat sheet, it is one of the worst displays of efficiency you will see. Only touched the ball 13 times and went at a shocking 23% efficiency. Certainly not a day to remember for the young man. Gone, surely it's Sanders' time now. And before we get to Richards, Darcy Jones, such bad luck for the young fella, going off with a hammy and now out for the short term. Frustrating because he hasn't made enough coin to cash him out, and that low score sort of stuffs his short term cash in anyway. So personally, 
I think that I might use him as a loop between, you know, your Sextons or your Darcy's or else potentially just get rid of him and bring in Mr. Ed Richards this week. I just said Ed, didn't I? I butchered it. It is Joey Richards. So Joe Richards, I think he's going to be probably the most popular trade-in rookie this week. Scored 60 points on the weekend. Slowed down a little bit after a hot start. Ended with 12 touches, 5 tackles, and a goal. So impacted the scoreboard. Defensive pressure was on. That should bode well for him. I think that Fly really likes blokes that put on that defensive pressure, are willing to play a role for the team. We know that Elliott is out for the short term, which hopefully allows Richards to keep his spot warm while he's out at an absolute minimum. But hopefully, again, even after that, he's got the game and the potential to keep a spot in that side. It's going to be tough. We know that they're obviously the premiers from last year, starting to play some of their best football again. So pretty scary for opposition sides at the moment. But with his break-even at negative, uh, what's that, negative 95, 384, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. Remember, a really nice score the week before this against the Eagles, albeit not fantastic opposition. But the opposition was a little bit tougher last week. He still managed a decent score. Didn't smash it out of the park. But with a modest projected score of under 50, he's still going to rise over 65K. So for me, he is clearly the best buy here out of all the bubble boys. And if you've got a spare forward spot, I suggest that you bring Mr. Joe in. So that's it for now, guys. All the best of luck with your trade-ins and your trade-outs, and I'll see you soon in the next one. Cheers, bye.